Hello there. My name is Christopher Masinski. I'm an assistant professor here at Syracuse, and I'm going to be the lead instructor of this course, CIS 352, this spring here at SU. I wanted to take a few minutes to talk to you about some general course structure. Simply put, the goal of this course is to help you gain a mastery of programming such that your creativity is no longer limited by your sheer technical skills. Now we're going to do this in several different ways. First, we're going to teach you how to program in Racket, a functional programming language. Now trust me, we're not doing this because we think you're going to get a job as an engineer programming in Racket. We're doing it because the extreme expressivity afforded by Racket's ecosystem will allow us to quickly experiment with and implement a variety of ideas in programming. Now once we learn Racket to a sufficient degree, we're actually going to start building some programming languages of our own. Now we're not going to build a whole programming language end to end. That would be the kind of thing you would do in a compilers course. But we will be implementing a variety of programming languages features that are pretty, uh, pretty surprisingly interesting and students really tell us they have a lot of fun in these, uh, in these projects. Now when you design a course in programming languages, you always have to balance a variety of trade-offs. I've chosen to focus our course on the operational semantics of programming languages. In other words, I want to help you understand precisely what your programs are going to do. And I want to help you judiciously pick your programming constructs that you can do exactly what you think you mean. Now I've spent many years now working with students. And I've noticed that many of them often feel scared or unsure of their programming skills when they enter this course. Often for particularly challenging segments of code, they'll get into the habit of just hacking away at things until they work, kind of like a video game. And that leads to kind of very broken code in all this sort of subtle ways that when they try to build something real, it just kind of falls apart. Now the goal of this course is to help you fix those kinds of tendencies. We want to help you uh, systematically understand your code so that this process of debugging can go from seemingly impossible to just merely annoying. We want you to come out of the course with the kind of confidence that you can write high quality, correct code to tackle an ambitious and novel challenges that you come up with on your own. Now, I want to talk to you about a few logistical points. I first want to say all this information is in the syllabus, which outlines it even more precisely, and you should always be looking there for the most precise wording and up-to-date information. Broadly speaking, there are going to be three categories of points in this course. Participation, projects, and exam questions. Let's talk about projects and exams for first. The course has 12 learning objectives, roughly covering material taught in the first 12 weeks of class. There are going to be three 80-minute quizzes that occur at four-week intervals throughout the course. Each of these quizzes is cumulative, and it contains as many questions as there has been weeks in the course so far. In our specification-based grading approach, you can submit up to six answers on each quiz. So for example, if a quiz has eight questions on it, you can submit up to six solutions. Each exam or quiz uh, question is graded as either unsatisfactory satisfactory, or excellent. Resubmissions allow you to raise your score. So let's say on quiz zero you get a satisfactory grade on problem zero, but you get an unsatisfactory grade on problem two. Then you study hard, and for quiz one, there is another ability to reattempt learning objective zero, which is a different question, but on the same topic. Now also note that we'll only ever increase your score. So let's say you reattempt a problem that you got satisfactory on. Well, you won't regress to unsatisfactory just because you didn't do a very good job on that reattempt. You'll only be able to raise your grade on learning objective zero up to excellent previously from satisfactory. The final is going to be 120 minutes rather than 80, and it's going to allow you to reattempt up to six different learning objectives all throughout the course. Now let's talk about projects. There are going to be six projects in the course. All of them are going to be written in the Racket programming language, and all of the projects are due at 11.59 p.m., the last day of class. You can submit these projects at any time throughout the semester using an auto-grading-based uh, web system named autograde.org. This is a web-based autograder that allows you to submit your code and have it automatically graded on a variety of both public, i.e. you have access to them, and so-called secret tests that you don't have the source for. We'll explain the autograder in detail later, 
But for each project, you'll go to autograde.org, you'll click on the corresponding project that you're going to be working on, and it's going to give you a git link to a repository. You're going to do a git clone to that repository, you'll do your work, and then when you're ready to submit your code, you can do a commit and push to the server. You can then go on to autograde.org, where the web-based interface will let you specify precisely which version of the code that you want tested. Submitting your code for testing on Autograde costs the number of tokens, and these tokens regenerate around midnight every day. The upshot of this is that you can submit your code for testing a few times a day. Now, projects are graded as either minimally satisfactory, satisfactory, or excellent. These grades are specified on a per-project basis, and they'll be sort of fleshed out in the project handout that we give for each project. Now, based on your quiz and exam scores and your, um, these learning objectives, you'll get a, a base grade. You calculate this using a table we'll give in the syllabus. For example, to get an A, you'll need to submit at least six out of six minimally satisfactory projects, five satisfactory projects, and three excellent projects, along with 12 out of 12 exam questions uh, that are satisfactory and six out of 12 excellent questions on exams. If we make changes to final grading, we'll do so only in a way that benefits students by lowering these bars uniformly. We won't give bonus on a per-student basis. Now to calculate your final grade, you'll take a minus or a plus of this base grade based on participation. If you get fewer than 20 participation points, your grade will be lowered by a minus. So for example, you'll go from a 4.0 to a 3.7. If you get between a 20 and a 30, you'll get no change from your base grade. And if you get above a 30, you'll get a plus. So you could go from a 3.7 to a 4.0 or a 3.0 to a 3.3, for example. Now, note that we can't actually send a grade of 4.3 to the registrar. If you do get that grade, I will write it down for tracking purposes for recommendation letters, but I'll report a 4.0. Now you can get these participation points in a variety of ways. The biggest one is participation quizzes. Before each Tuesday or Thursday class, there's going to be a quiz on, uh, quiz on Blackboard consisting of two to four questions. If you get greater than 50% on the quiz, you'll get that participation point. Now there are at least 27 of these available for the, or I guess 27 of, now there are 27 of these participation points available from these 27 different classes. You'll also have weekly exercises. These are going to be small coding projects that you'll complete with your group, and then you'll submit individually on the auto grader. There will probably be roughly between 10 and 12 of these. You'll get a participation point for each one of them that you get correct. I'll also be giving a participation point for having a brief meeting with me in office hours to talk about your career goals and plans. There will be a few other times throughout the semester that we'll give ad hoc participation points, including if you volunteer to do live coding or if your group volunteers to present a solution to a problem. I understand it can seem pretty overwhelming to have a participation quiz during each class, but if you sort of think about it, those are only 27 out of the available participation quizzes. So you can also do things like exercises, and I really hope you won't feel under pressure to have to be doing these on every single day. My hope is that you can miss a few of them from time to time, but mostly try to stay on top of them. We really don't want any students falling through the cracks, and having participation quizzes, uh, it really provides some incentives for you, but it also really gives us an idea of where the class is at. Now, before we wrap up, I want to talk briefly about the honor code expectations in this class. Now, precise details are going to be given in the syllabus, but I'll give the short, uh, short version here. Now, simply put, you should not be collaborating with anyone on quizzes, the final, or projects. We'll be using elaborate cheat detection software for both exams and projects, and this software is robust to things like variable renaming and function inlining. Last year, we submitted honor code cases about, uh, against about 10% of students in the class, and all of these cases were upheld. Based on these cases, I've tried to redesign the course grading so that it eliminates the incentive to cheat. If you miss a question on a quiz, you can always redo it later, and you can submit projects as often as you want. We really want you to be able to get whatever grade you want, and we're really willing to work with you to achieve that. Now last, I want to say all the lectures are going to be freely available on YouTube under a Creative Commons license. If you're a student at Syracuse, you'll also get access to the course Slack, along with the time of me and the TAs. 
I would strongly urge you to reach out on Slack whenever you get stuck for more than 20, uh, 20 or 30 minutes. Now, for better or for worse, I often spend pretty much all of my time on Slack when I'm teaching um, during semesters when I'm working with students. I try to make myself very available to answer any questions whenever students have any issues they're facing. The synchronous component of this course will consist of class announcements, problem solving, and then some structured group work with peers. You'll spend about 40 out of 80 minutes each day in class working with your group on a variety of exercises and coming up with questions that you want to ask the rest of the class. Now, if you're not a student with Syracuse, but you just stumbled onto these lectures, and if you find them especially helpful, please let me know. I'm happy to help grade uh, or give you access to the projects so that you can then attempt them on the autograder. And I'll also say that if you find these lectures especially helpful, I've put links in the description to some of our scholarship funds, and I hope you'll consider donating. All right, so that wraps up this video on course logistics. The next few videos are going to introduce the Racket programming language. So all right, I'll see you in class. Thank you.